Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Good afternoon. I'd like to lodge a claim. Certainly. Name? Emily Jane Appleby. Appleby, that's an unusual name. Sorry, what did you say your first name was again? Emily Jane. Now, Miss Appleton, could you please fill in this claim form? I've never done that before. Can you help me? Yes, of course. The first part is for your the claimant's details. Where do you live? Um, at One Yeronga Street, Durham. How do you spell Durham? D U R H A M. Of course, I should know that, but it's just one of those names that sounds quite different from the way you spell it. It is confusing. I've seen it spelt with two R's. And what's the postcode for Durham? Four one o five. Good. And do you work? No, not at the moment. Okay, so no work number. What about a home phone number? Yes, I can give you that. It's seven eight four eight three seven six two. Seven eight four eight three seven six two. Right. Now this part here is for the respondent's details. Who's the respondent? The individual person, company, or business that you're claiming against is the claim against a landlord, tenant, trader, or driver. Well, it's a company that sells home appliances. So that's trader then. Just a moment while I write that down. ABC Appliances, actually. Oh, now this part is really important. If the respondent is a company, you must have the company's full and correct name and registered address. I've looked it up on the internet, and it's ABC Appliances Limited. Good. If we don't get this part absolutely right, you won't have a legal claim. And their registered address? Yes, I've got that written down here. Just a minute. It's um, seventeen Brown Avenue. That's in Barden, isn't it? I think I know the place. My wife bought a vacuum cleaner there last month. Yes, Barden. Have you got the postcode for Barden? It's really similar to mine. Wait a moment. I'd better make sure I get it right. Four zero six five. That's it. And what's the telephone number for ABC Appliances? Oh, um, seven two three two four six eight one. Good. Got that. Now, in the third part of this form, we get to the actual goods or services that are in dispute. I assume you made a purchase from them. Yes, that's right. On the third of February, two thousand eleven. And did the goods have any sort of guarantee or warranty? Yes, but only for six months. So it was just a six-month warranty. Yes, they offered me an extended warranty for three years, but I would have had to pay extra for that. Oh, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. You'll need to give a full description of the goods involved, the nature of the defect or fault, and any other relevant particulars. So, tell me, what did you buy? I bought a washing machine. Yes, but what brand, model, and serial number? The brand name was Mallard. And it was the Whisper model serial number. Just a moment, I've got the warranty papers in my bag. Yes, here it is, serial number X Y three zero three. Great. Now I need to know how much you agreed to pay. It cost a thousand pounds. Did you trade in your old machine? 
Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Okay. Now, what were you given for the trade in? 250 pounds. So, in actual fact, the purchase price you agreed on was 750 pounds. That's right. And they delivered the goods two days later, on the 5th of March, and picked up the trade in at the same time. Now, think carefully about this next question. What did the respondent say about the quality of the goods or the way they would perform? The salesman who served me at the appliance shop said, The Mallet Whisper model has a much shorter cycle, so it uses less power. Oh, and he added, And it will also use less water. Is that true? Well, partly. It does seem to use less water. But both the wash cycle and the rinse cycle go on for much longer than my old machine, so I don't see how it can use less electricity. But the sales assistant also said, This model is whisper quiet. And is it? No, not at all. It's so noisy we can't hear the television in the next room. Excuse me, I have to answer that. Would you mind waiting? I'll get back to you in a minute. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a representative from Dreamtime Tours giving information about a particular tour option. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Dreamtime Tours have just the tour for you. The one I have chosen to talk to you about today is what I consider our best tour. It will take you from coast to mountain and back again. You'll spend a memorable and very comfortable day traveling in air conditioned luxury. You'll see from our brochure. That we have four pickup stops along the coast, and about 20 minutes after we pick up our last passenger for the day, we'll be stopping off briefly at a magnificent housing development, marina, and shopping complex. You'll be able to admire some of the most expensive and lavish houses on the coast, and here we'll take a quick walk around the waterfront. Now, despite its name, Hope Island. We can reach it without getting our feet wet or taking a boat ride. Hope Island is connected to the mainland by bridges. From there, we head inland to the beautiful Tambourine Mountain. You'll have time to browse in the many specialty shops, or you can sit and relax at a friendly outdoor cafe. We board the bus again and pass through an old timber milling town on our way to O'Reilly's Green Mountains. Once there, you might wish to venture across the famous treetop walk, which is a bridge suspended in the canopy of a rainforest. Definitely not for the faint hearted. If you're not up to the excitement of this walk, or perhaps after you've done it, why not enjoy lunch on the balcony of O'Reilly's restaurant? Before we leave, you'll have time for a stroll through the botanical gardens. Or perhaps you'd like to feed the beautiful parrots and other birds. We'll supply the bird seed. From O'Reilly's, we travel to an alpaca farm for a demonstration, and of course, there'll be a photo opportunity for you 
with these gorgeous animals before returning to the coach for the journey back to your original departure point. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. If I've persuaded any of you to sign up for this tour, take a look at our Dreamtime Tours brochure. You'll see that you can book over the telephone, or you can make reservations through the reception desk. We generally have a member of staff manning the desk from 7.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day of the week. Don't hesitate to ask reception staff any questions that you might have about this tour or any other tour, and be sure to make it known if you have any special needs. We'll do our best to make your trip rewarding and worthwhile. If this is the tour you want, be sure to specify Green Mountain Tour, and note that these excursions are full-day tours on three days of the week only, Sunday, Monday, and Friday, although we're hoping to have a Saturday tour available by next year. You'll see that fares are extremely reasonable, with each adult paying just $37. Now, that's not bad for a trip of around 280 kilometers, is it? If you want to bring the family, obviously, the family pass is great value at $94. That includes two adults and two children. But if you're an older adult, over 65, in other words, a senior citizen, your fare is discounted too. You'll pay a bit less than the full adult rate. Please note the departure times. We adhere to these strictly. The coach will leave the southernmost point of Kulangata at 10 to 8 sharp, travel through Burleigh, and on to Surfer's Paradise, which is our most popular pickup point departing from there at half-past eight in the morning. At a quarter to nine, we make our last pickup at Labrador. May I remind you to dress appropriately for the day? Ladies, no high heels, please. Comfortable walking shoes are what is required, and I always recommend that everyone takes a light jacket, because the mountain air can be quite cool compared to the heat and humidity of the coastal regions. Oh, something else I should remind you of. The prices quoted in the brochure are just for coach travel. Although we can arrange for a minibus to collect you from your accommodation and bring you to the departure point free of charge. If you want to avail yourself of this service, be sure to let the booking clerk know. You will need to bring along extra cash or a credit card to cover expenses such as optional side trips, food and drink, and of course, entrance fees to the various attractions. Well, that's all I have time to tell you. If you have further inquiries, please use the phone number on the brochure. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between two training college students and their liaison officer who is enrolling them in a volunteer program which provides English language support in a local secondary school. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in and sit down, Lester. Sharon, I can see you're keen to know more. To start with, I'd just like to say that we value volunteers highly and recognize their importance and assistance in the provision of quality education. Thank you. We're looking forward to helping out. But what exactly can we do? Volunteers can undertake a range of tasks. In general, they enrich the English language program and complement the contributions of salaried staff members. Yes, but what would we do specifically? Oh, a variety of tasks. For instance, you can tutor individual students in reading. I thought that might be the case. But you can also help students edit their written responses. Great. Is that also a one-on-one -on -one activity? Oh, yes, definitely. But volunteers are also called on to assist in designated classes. And what exactly would we do there? Well, it depends on the class, of course, but usually you take on the role of an assistant. A teacher's assistant. Yes, that's it. Sounds like fun and good preparation for our own careers. Then, an enormous area of assistance is developing students' organizational skills. Yes, I can imagine that's why some of them are struggling in the first place. There's also the special needs unit. They always need volunteers there. But we have no training in special needs. That's not necessary. These students just really appreciate having any extra attention. Sometimes help with the simplest things, like holding a pen correctly. Ah, uh, well, that's something all able-bodied students should learn. I've noticed some of the strangest pen grips amongst my peers, and I'm sure they must end up with sore hand or shoulder muscles at the end of the day. Yes, I'm sure you're right. The other task I'd like you two to help out with is encouraging and improving the student's work ethic. Oh, I can't imagine that'll be easy. No, but it is important, and I can give you some training in that field. That'll be good. I should also point out that you'll be working alongside quality teachers at times who are not only caring role models, but excellent motivators. Well, we should learn a lot from them. Yes, the teachers you'll be assigned to are innovative and very responsive to the different needs of individual students. If that's true, they must be adept at a variety of teaching styles. Quite right. You know, part of my mission is to forge close partnerships between experienced teachers and trainees like yourselves. As far as I can see, Everyone has something to gain from the exchange of information and skills, not just the students you're helping. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. There are a number of interesting developments going on at the moment, and I have chosen you two because of your varied academic backgrounds. Now you, Sharon. I majored in business studies before I came to Teachers Training College. Yes, exactly. Well, I've always been more interested in science marine biology in particular. Yes, I think it's quite exciting. The school you're going to assist at is augmenting the number of vocational learning experiences offered within its subjects. Educational philosophy these days seems to recognize the importance of increasing practical components in the curriculum. Areas of development being pursued include building and construction, agriculture, business education, and hospitality. But the Marine Studies course is already well-developed. 
Oh, now I see where we fit in. You'll find that the school has an excellent library and audiovisual collection. There are three computer laboratories and a special needs network with six stations. Ah, they are well equipped. Hmm. Wait till you see their independent learning center. What's so special about their ILC? They have the most sophisticated self-learning software I've ever seen in this region of the country. Really? Uh huh. And there's a wide number of extracurricular activities, an extensive sporting program. Oh, sport? Not my thing at all. Well, no, maybe not. But they also promote students' participation in different scholastic competitions. I'm impressed. I think we're going to enjoy this. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk by a health studies lecturer on anxiety. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My talk today is on anxiety. Anxiety is something you've all experienced at some time in your life, so you'll know that it's an emotional condition in which feelings of dread, fear, and mental agitation predominate. However, what we call an anxiety state or anxiety neurosis or phobic state they all mean the same thing, is characterized by anxiety reactions far greater than those normally expected for the circumstances, and these reactions may be severe and prolonged. This is the most common form of neurosis in westernized countries. Usually, normal anxiety decreases with repeated exposure to the feared situation, whereas a neurotic anxiety tends to increase. Gradually, the person is inclined to avoid the feared situation and views it with increasing dread. Sometimes there may be an inherited tendency for this, but usually environmental issues are more important. The individual may have been a worrier throughout life, and a stressful condition, just before symptoms set in, is common. Often there is a gradual build-up of anxiety, possibly for weeks or months before the ultimate break occurs. The precipitating cause is usually one of great significance to the patient, often related to personal events, such as bereavement, a breakup, threats to career, health, or personal integrity. What are the symptoms of phobia? Well, phobic states often develop into severe, crippling challenges that can be very difficult to overcome. The person develops a fear of certain situations. It's not uncommon to have one or more of these present at the same time. I'm going to name some frequent phobias and give you a description of their symptoms. Let's start with agoraphobia, which is when the person has an intense anxiety about venturing outside the safety of the normal home surroundings. It may be impossible for this person to ever go out alone. Their fear of public or open spaces is completely irrational, and they often end up leading very secluded lives. Claustrophobia, on the other hand, is a morbid fear of closed-in areas or places. If you see me taking the stairs instead of the lift, think about it. Am I trying to get more exercise, 
Or am I trying to avoid the confined interior of the lift? And I'm sure you all know people who are afraid of flying. Sometimes it's the fear of being enclosed in the aeroplane itself, and you can imagine how the cramped confines of airline toilets are really bad news for these sufferers. Now I'll move on to discuss social phobia, which, believe it or not, is more common in men. It's an acute anxiety that develops when they are in the presence of others. They feel self-conscious, apprehensive, and embarrassed. If attention, real or imagined, is focused on the sufferer, he becomes uneasy and may blush, stammer, or stutter. Some sufferers even develop tremors, shaking or trembling movements of a part or parts of the body. Or another very common sign of their extreme discomfort is that they perspire profusely on their palms, under their arms, or on their feet. That brings me to the last one that I want to mention today, and that is single phobia. And no, it's not a fear of lifelong bachelorhood. This one is actually precipitated by an acute aversion to dogs, cats, spiders. You may have heard of the term arachnophobia. Well, it applies specifically to spiders, but any single thing can basically cause a strong aversion. Snakes, frogs. Mice or rats, for instance. I can assure you, the list is unlimited. You name it, and someone is sure to have a phobia about it. Some people are terrified of the dark, for example, and I'm not talking about young children here. You'd be surprised how many adults are afflicted in this way. Well, I see our time is up. Next week, I'll go into some of the treatments and therapies for phobias that have been used over the ages, and some of the relatively new drugs that have recently come on the scene. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.